Thanks for coming back. We've got Arthur Higgins on, and uh, let's let's start out kind of back clear back when you were in college, and you actually were studying zoology, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, my interest in art really started a lot earlier than that, and my interest in zoology was simultaneous because zoology is uh, illustrated, and I love those drawings. And when I was in my 10, 11, 12 years old, I loved those drawings a lot. And so I was a, a bug collector and I liked invertebrates. And my mother got me a library card to the uh, zoology stacks at the University of Washington. And every week I would go in and look at the drawings, the most magnificent drawings. So the, my interest in, in biology really was in concert with drawing, okay. because that's the way zoologists and botanists talk, is they draw what they're talking, and I love those drawings. Okay. So that's actually, that actually, I would assume, then helped you get into becoming an artist? Yeah. When I went to the university, well, first of all, I started taking, when I was 10, 11 years old, I took pictures of things that I was interested in, nature things, mushrooms and flowers and plants and things like that, but what I took pictures of wasn't really what I wanted to, to take a picture of. So then I looked at these zoology drawings and botany drawings and thought, well, maybe if I did scientific illustrations, if I did them precisely in watercolor, I would get closer to what I was really trying to say. So I did that, and I studied with an artist in Seattle when I was uh, 16 or so, um, and he taught me how to paint realistic watercolors, right, photorealistic. But that still wasn't the answer to what I was trying to do. Uh, so when I went to the University of Washington, I studied uh, scientific drawing and medical illustration and ended up doing uh, the medical illustration style, which is quite different from scientific drawing, mm -hmm. and then sought employment. I had my portfolio and trekked around this university <laughs> looking for work uh, and finally got a job with an anthropologist drawing pictures of rocks or he called them projectile points. To me, they were rocks. <laughs> okay. But they were chipped rocks, and every chip had to be in there. And uh, I did that for the uh, magnificent sum of uh, $2.50 an hour. Well, minimum wage was $1.13. Wow. So, yeah, I was, I was a high roller. Yeah. But it, it wasn't enough money. And so the next year, I bought uh, a, a commercial fishing boat. Um, using borrowed money from my father. And I began fishing in southeastern Alaska. And that was my connection to Alaska, okay. and I really never left. Okay. Um, th I was also doing freelance illustration, uh, working with fishing game people and that sort of thing, because they liked the style of drawing that I did, pen and ink primarily in those days. This was the days before computers, so right. it was all black and white mostly. Uh, but that's how I got my start. Okay. And then when did the teaching at the University of Alaska come into play? Well, it was in later years. I lived in Alaska for 25 years, 10 years in Juneau, and I had shows there and did a lot of work, but I was still fishing pretty active. The thing about fishing was only six months out of the year, so okay. it gave me the rest of the year to do right. art. Uh, when I moved into the interior, I moved to Wasilla, and uh, that's when I became uh, really active in a, uh, what was called a Visual Arts Center in Anchorage, and that was a real turning point in my career because it was a facility for our professional artists. They had printing presses and last wax cast machines and all that kind of stuff, and I got really involved in that. Uh, it wasn't until uh, later uh, that I started teaching at the university, and what I did at the university was primarily, a, uh, I worked at a contract, and I was hired to develop courses for them, and then I would teach them to see if the course worked. Oh, okay. Because the primary school at the University of Alaska was in Fairbanks, and Anchorage had the biggest population, but they really didn't have much of an art department that was well organized, and they needed stuff to, to be taught. So I designed courses in jewelry and in printmaking and in uh, drawing and painting. Okay, all right. And then eventually down the road somewhere, you ended up going into a business relationship with another individual and sh the lady that you were uh, professionally involved with there wanted to kind of keep things more like on the north coast or on the on the west coast kind of smaller even i think in just the northwest and you were thinking a bit bigger than that is that right yeah that that's what I, uh, in the 70s, I guess it was in Alaska, I was doing public art commissions. And I had to leave Alaska because they were going to build a road through my studio. 
Oh. And living in the fast lane was just not my style. <laughs> At least not that one. Not that one. I had had 25 years of winters up there, so I decided to move down here, and I met this woman here locally in the Dalles who wanted me to design jewelry for her. And I did that, uh, but she was strictly wanted to do it within the gorge. She was a master at sales and business. She was really very good at that. But her view was only to keep it in Oregon. Okay. Well, I got really stressed out because I was producing this stuff day and night, literally. And uh, so I went to California and I found a caster there that could do the work, but she had, would have nothing to do with that. She wanted it all in Oregon. And I huh. said, no, <laughs> we've got to think national. Uh huh. And it was at that point that she, we decided that it wasn't going to work. Okay. So then I decided to follow my own advice. And the next year, I started the business with the wind pedals. Okay, okay. And then you had like some really successful art shows in, was it Philadelphia and Atlanta? Those are, or? yes. Uh, those are trade shows, wholesale trade shows for the craft industry. One is the Wholesale Buyer Market of American Craft in Philadelphia. The other is the American Crafts Council show in Baltimore. And they were back to back and they're the two biggest wholesale shows in the United States. And with those two shows, you could make a year's living. Really? So that's what I did. And then uh, the garden industry began to Im increase and these, uh, the Atlanta Merchandise Mart decided they wanted to have a garden section in their merchandise because at this time they didn't have that. Okay. I was doing business with contemporary craft galleries. So that's when I got a booth at the Merchandise Mart in Atlanta. And that really turned everything over because the catalog companies visited. So I got a garden business and a contemporary craft business. Okay. So when Plow and Hearth walks by or Gardener Supply or L.L. Bean, no, I was there ready and willing. Catalogs were almost like what we now can think of with internet shopping. I mean, they were like yeah. sort of the first... Before internet shopping, you'd go to that one place and go through and find all kinds of what you were looking for. Yeah, and it was a strange business because they were very fickle. If what they bought from you sold, you know, you were their favorite son. Uh -huh. But if as soon as it, and they had all these standards and everything that were quite unfamiliar to to me, especially as an artist from the art side of things. But as I said. I treated this as a business. Mm -hmm. So when Nature Company came by and wanted these patina designs, sure, I'll do that. I'll right. be happy to do that. Right. But it was a real interesting period in, of time. I did the LL Bean for three years. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I want to talk to you when, uh, when we come back from the break about something that actually we were talking about before the show started, which got me kind of excited, which is some of these radio-controlled airplanes that you're <laughs> building and stuff. So we'll talk about some of that stuff when we come back. Uh, we'll be right back.